So I just published my first first author review article with my group leader Masashi. So hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video I will highlight the key points from our article we wrote together because why not? There are a few covers, P53 and cellular senescence, so if either of those topics is of interest to you or you're just intrigued to hear what researchers do and how we go writing about these things, then watch on. So firstly, as I said, this is a review article, not a research paper, so we summarise and discuss, well, as much as possible, research articles relevant to my two topics I spend much, much time thinking about, cellular senescence and the world's coolest protein, P53. So firstly, an introduction to each. P53. This is a protein that is expressed in your cells. The canonical function of this protein is to enter the nucleus of the cell where it acts as a transcription factor. It regulates the expression of genes by binding near the gene and bringing in cell machinery that causes transcription. This is the first step of gene expression where the DNA sequence is read and an RNA copy is made. This RNA copy is then read to make protein. Usually, levels of P53 protein are kept quite low within a cell. Only when a cell becomes stressed does P53 protein accumulate. It can then enter the nucleus and regulate the expression of other genes. One of the most famous targets of P53 is the gene encoding the protein P21. P21 is a protein that can stop a cell from replicating. This is thought to be beneficial under stress as it gives the cell time to try and resolve the stress. If the stress isn't resolved, then the cell may transition into cellular senescence. Which was a nice segue to tell you about cellular senescence. And so when a cell enters senescence, it not only stops dividing, but it also develops a secretory phenotype, referred to as the senescence-associated secretory phenotype, or the SASP as we like to say. This refers to soluble factors that are secreted from senescent cells that include a smuggers board of components. These components influence the surrounding tissue environment and enable communication between cells. For example, components including inflammatory factors that can activate immune cells. For example, it includes components like inflammatory factors that are thought to be able to recruit and activate immune cells that could down the line clear the senescent cells. Now, as you can see in this beautiful figure that I made earlier, we show that P53 influences both the cell cycle arrest and the SASP. I've already established how P53 promotes cell cycle arrest, but the SASP, now that's more complex. There are two main transcription factors, NF-kappa-B and CEBP-beta, that control many SASP components. However, it seems that P53 can influence these factors such as indirectly regulating NF-kappa-B. Some earlier work showed that if you knock down P53, as in reduce the overall abundance of it in a cell, then certain inflammatory factors seem to increase, suggesting that P53 has a repressive component over the SASP. And so it's important for me to highlight what I've written here, which is a simplified view of how P53 governs the cell cycle arrest and the SASP. As our view, firstly, isn't complete. But the second thing we were trying to highlight with this figure is that the two components, the cell cycle arrest and the SASP, seem to be decoupled. That is, you can repress one component without affecting the other. However, again, I'm going to have to emphasise the word simplified, as this recent paper describes how P21 can also influence the SASP. So if I had a hula hoop representing each aspect, the cell cycle arrest and the SASP, then there probably would be some kind of overlap between them. But I think you should also try and imagine as if both of the loops are currently being hula hooping. And so they sort of oscillate in terms of the overlap. In other words, this is my way of saying that we don't fully know how, but what it does reinforce is the idea that P53 must be tightly regulated to control its various activities in senescence. And the reason we think that P53 needs to be tightly regulated is because P53 is a bit of a jack of all traits. Well, not quite all traits, but cellular senescence is just one of many things that P53 appears to control. Other aspects include causing cell death. So clearly something unique, or a collection of unique things is happening to control P53 such that it results in senescence and not one of these alternative outcomes. And these unique things include controlling how much of P53 is present, its localization, whether it's in the nucleus, chilling in the cytoplasm, or up to no good at the mitochondria, 
as well as P53 modifications, such as phosphorylation, acetylation, and ubiquitination. These can influence the stability, the activity, and the location of P53. And in terms of its activity, I've mentioned already it's a transcription factor, and it does this by binding to DNA. And earlier work from my lab, before I joined, looked at where P53 binds in the nucleus on DNA. Because P53 doesn't just bind anywhere, it binds near to genes it regulates the expression of. P53 is known to bind to specific consensus sequences, known as the P53 response elements. The word consensus is the perfect word here, but that's its own story of its own. What I want to say is that our lab looked at where P53 was binding, when cells were happy and growing, when there was the initial acute stress, and when the cell had entered senescence. And the most interesting observation was that P53 bound to its response elements when there was acute stress and in senescence. But in senescence, and another form of more chronic stress, you could also see these broader P53 binding sites in so-called CPG islands. And so again, I tried to beautifully depict this in my figure, where we can see where we think P53 binds in these different scenarios. So this is sort of where the catchy title comes back. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Which I have to be upfront and honest and say that this title was not my idea. Shout out to Joanna and her genius brain. Because senescence isn't a sprint. At least in cell culture experiments, it can take days to establish. And like how you would prepare differently for a sprint versus a marathon, the regulation and downstream consequences of P53 also appear to differ. We refer to P53 here as chronic to distinguish it from the canonical acute response. We just don't have the complete picture yet. But part of the reason we see differential binding of P53 in chronic and acute phases could be due to the changes in the accessibility of DNA. Basically, how the DNA is compacted and localised within the nucleus. Our lab is interested in how DNA is packaged in the nucleus during senescence and how this relates to what genes are being expressed. A paper published from our lab, fortuitously a few days before the review came out, showed that in senescence we see the expression of genes that we wouldn't expect to be expressed. In senescence lung cells we could see aberrant gene expression of skin genes. In growing lung cells these genes are tightly packaged and repressed but in senescence, they're decompacted. But the decompacting alone isn't sufficient. And guess what? Two proteins were identified to be involved in enabling the expression of these skin genes. One protein we briefly met earlier, CEBP beta, try saying that 10 times super fast, and the world's coolest protein. So this is the final section of the review, trying to understand the consequences of P53's actions. This is a more recent emerging area of interest in our lab, but I can't help draw comparisons to more general theories of ageing, namely Sinclair's informational theory of ageing, whereby as cells age, they lose their identity. So for example here, how the lung fibroblast cells are expressing skin genes, so losing their identity. So maybe part of senescence is a loss of identity due to aberrant regulation of genes. But it's also possible that maybe these skin genes do have a function in senescence, we just don't really know what it is yet. But still, it's all pretty interesting. And so, the best bit of all of this is that my article is open access, so any of you can read it and get all those extra nerdy details should you wish. And yeah, as I said at the start, this is my first, first author paper. Even if it's just a review, I still think it's pretty cool. I hope my PhD work will be able to add to our understanding and we'll share what I have when I have it. So yeah, that's it. Review articles are really quite challenging to write, but very rewarding as it encourages you to really think about data published and whether there are unanimous results or conflicts. The big challenge for me is both senescence and P53 are very big topics. And so trying to read everything is near impossible, but I do what I can. So with that, I hope you've learned something in this video. Thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you for listening.